At home in a smart Washington suburb, Cox waited for the inevitable. He did call me early in the evening and he said he had received notice from the White House that a messenger was on the way. It's only 20 minutes from the White House. And 20 minutes went by, 40 minutes went by, an hour went by, nothing happens. And then I got another call and Archie said the messenger had gotten lost and so he still hadn't heard. Finally, there's rapping on the front door, a uh, disheveled uh, driver appears and uh, had a message which he handed me. Nixon was finally rid of his turbulent prosecutor, but it would prove harder still to abolish Cox's office and sack his staff. Saturday morning, got up, and uh, my wife and I, uh, we took the kids and we went to Luray Caverns for the day. Didn't have the radio on, no TV, just quietness. We're coming home, the kids are asleep in the car. Put the key in a door and the telephone's ringing. So my wife goes in and answers the phone. I'm yelling, don't answer the phone. She goes in to answer the phone and she says, it's for you. I says, oh no. Angelo Lano was the FBI agent who'd worked longest on the Watergate case. The call was from his boss. He said, uh, uh, Richardson's been fired, Cox has been fired, and you have to get over and take over the prosecutor's office. And I said, what? And I said, who, wait a minute. I said, who told you this? Acting Attorney General Bork's second order that night caused almost as much uproar as the first. It was issued to protect prosecution documents from the prosecutors. Hague told me that these documents were disappearing from the uh, special prosecutor's office. Shouldn't we put the FBI around there? And I said yes. Having done a difficult evening's duty, Robert Bork went home. The streets were pitch dark by the time, of course, and as I came out of the driveway of the Department of Justice, photographers from the press leapt out of the bushes. <laughs> And, they, and I was quite surprised that there's this picture of me uh, looking like an axe murderer. The outcry was just beginning. The office of the Watergate Special Prosecution Force has been abolished. When as the White House announced what they'd done, the media reported it as a naked attempt by the president to overthrow the rule of law. The country tonight is in the midst of what may be the most serious constitutional crisis in its history. The president has fired the special Watergate prosecutor, Archibald Cox, and he has sent FBI agents to the office of the special prosecution staff and to the attorney general and the deputy attorney general, and the president has ordered the FBI to seal off those offices. That's a stunning development, and nothing even remotely like it has happened in all of our history. We had no idea whether the Army was coming, uh, the Marines. Uh, we had no idea whether our files would be taken away from us. Uh, we were told nothing. Halfway through dinner, the phone rang. It was Hank Ruth, and he said, Archie's been fired get to the office and save the evidence. The young prosecutors got there before Angelano, the FBI man they'd always worked with. And, uh, so it went up, a couple of the pros assistant prosecutors were there, and they said, and they started yelling at me. Accused them of, uh, of uh, treachery, treason, working with the enemy, having uh, been a pawn of the White House, we put it every which way we could. So finally, Henry Ruth shows up, and I figured, oh, my salvation. So Hank comes in, and I said, we go into the office. I said, Hank, first of all, I don't want to be here. And I told him what had happened. And I said, whose side are you on, Angie? Are you with us, or are you against us? And he said, I'm just doing my job. And I said, well, where are your written orders, Angie? You know, and I just said, take it out on somebody else, you know. I'm, I, I didn't want to come here. I don't want to be here. And I'm going to get out of here as quick as I can. He said, nothing goes in and nothing goes out. And I said, well, suppose I have some personal letters from my wife or something like that. He said, you can't take them out. I don't remember that. It was so hot in there that night. You know, <laughs> if I did, you know, I'm sorry, but 
Uh, that that was life. That's the way it went. Excuse me, boss. Despite the FBI and the late hour, the special prosecutor's office was besieged by reporters. Our press guy, Jimmy Doyle, came and just came into my office finally and grabbed me and said, we're going upstairs. And I said, what for? And he said, the press is up there. You should have done this a long time ago and marched me upstairs to a very small room where we had our library. And it seemed like the entire Washington press corps was in there. It was smoky, it was uh, dark, uh, it was really mayhem. I must say, I suppose, that human emotions take over uh, in this kind of occasion, because one thinks that in a democracy maybe this would not happen and that maybe uh, we could proceed in good faith to prosecute those who have violated the criminal law. Apparently that is not to be the case, and we have been abolished. The special news bulletins carried on late into the night. The Tonight Show will not be seen tonight so that we may bring you the following NBC News special report. Mr. Cox's uh, comment when he was told that he was apparently about to be fired was whether ours shall continue to be a government of laws and not of men is now for Congress and ultimately the American people. An investigator appointed to investigate scandals was fired because he insisted on investigating scandals. That the president may have an even more grave constitutional crisis on his hands in my career as a correspondent, I never thought I'd be announcing these things.